Hello, everyone, and Sorry. welcome back to the Immersive Medical Podcast Season 2. Welcome to 2024. Uh, we are kicking off this season with a special guest host, Martha Levine. Connor's out on this one, and he is producing this episode. Thank you, Connor. So, Martha, tell us a little bit about who you are. Yeah, my name is Martha. I've been a nurse for about 28 years, and I work in virtual reality education and nursing faculty roles. Awesome. Well, I'm... This is exactly why we had you join this episode because we've got a special one for you to kick off this new year, folks. Uh, we have two very special guests on this episode, and we're going to talk about something really interesting that happened on LinkedIn. So our first guest is Susan Cardon Edgren. She is an associate professor at MGH Institute of Health Professions, and she is so much more. She is nurse faculty. She's a lecturer. She's a nurse scientist. She's been a professor and a director. She is a fellow for the American Academy of Nursing, a fellow at the Society of Simulation and Healthcare. She's a mentor for Nurse Faculty Leadership Academy, and she's got her CHSE certificate. She's also published, and she has done everything in nursing and is a wonderful advocate. If you don't know who Susie is, Find her on LinkedIn, Susan Cardon Edgren, and you'll go, oh, that woman who advocates and is a loud voice in nursing, I've seen her online. I've seen her post. I've seen her talk, and she's yeah, also giving a presentation. Simulation. So we're very proud to have her uh, joining us for the Immersive Med Pod. And who else we got? We also have Lisa Marie Wands. Lisa Marie is an associate clinical professor at the Nell Hodgson Woodruff School of Nursing at Emory University. She has experience as an associate clinical professor. She's been a VA quality scholar, a postdoc fellow, and so much more. She also is very well published in the area of nursing education. Oh, yeah. And both of these women, we didn't even get into all of the letters after their name. There are, <laughs> there are so many. RN, BSN, PhD, MSN. I mean, there's, there's a lot. So we are pleased Absolutely. to bring you Susie cardon Egren and Lisa Marie Wands. Welcome, both of you. We're glad to have you. Thank you. Thanks. What prompted this podcast recording today was actually an article that you guys posted on LinkedIn. So I kind of just want to dive into it and talk about it because I don't know if people really know how big of a problem this is. So we wanted to do a, a whole recording about it. And you two were the loudest voices and seem to be the, the largest advocates for this. And so let's let's talk a little bit about it. The the article was called Stop Pre-Licensure Student Abuse in Simulation. Uh, it was published on Simzine. And then I just saw you guys' repost and comments on uh, on LinkedIn. And Susie, I saw yours immediately was like bold letters, stop scaring students. So, you know, I could go in and summarize the article, but I really want to just toss the mic to you. Can you guys tell me what is uh, what's going on with student abuse and simulation? Can you... Susie, tell me what you mean by that. What's going on with this? Well, let me let me back up just a little bit and say that that I think I can't remember which happened first, but somehow, some way, um, Lisa, did Lisa Marie? Did you reach out to me and say, "Hey, let's do a podcast or let's do a webinar on this"? I I think it all happened at the same time. Somehow, I, the topic I think a lot of things like happened. Came yeah. up, yeah. And we and we did a webinar for the nursing SIG of of SSH, and we knew it was a problem. But what happened was beyond anything either of us have ever seen before, and that was that the chat on the side started running, and it was running and running, and people were putting in their stories. We were talking back and forth. Lisa Marie was trying to keep up and, and bring up ideas and things. But I think Lisa Marie can tell her side of it because I was busy chattering and visiting with people. But what you saw, Lisa, uh, was unbelievable. Yeah. So I'm the education coordinator for the nursing section for the Society for Simulation and Healthcare. And um, we sometimes run collaborative discussions on the nursing section's um, platform. And that's what this was, was an invitation to come and talk about this topic, about um, kind of incivility and student abuse in simulation. And so 
um, right out of the gate, just as soon as I posted the announcement, we had all kinds of interest in people making sure they had the date right and the time right because they didn't want to miss it. And then I asked um, Susie if she wanted to kind of co-facilitate with me because I realized it was really getting bigger and I wasn't sure I could do it on my own. So um, we set it out in kind of sections about, you know, what do you see as the problem? Um, you know, what can we do about it? And what are our future steps? And so we just kind of started out the discussion about asking people what did they perceive the problem to be? And that's when all of those stories were running uh, on, on the chat. Um, and people were just saying examples of things that they've seen in simulation with maybe colleagues who weren't fully prepared or trained, educated in how to be a good facilitator in simulation. And so having things like hidden agendas or maybe their own experiences kind of coming through in the way that they responded to students in simulation. Um, they also talked about, um, which this was really unfortunate, the idea about punishing students in simulation with harsh responses or um, if a student made a mistake, either kind of admonishing them or potentially having the patient scenario change unexpectedly or in kind of more dire ways than um, was scripted. Um, so really kind of just kind of going off script. So we talked a lot about the idea about preparation of faculty and how um, that was one way that one thing that was contributing to the problem. And then we were also starting to hear from our healthcare partners um, where they were saying, you know, they've they've used um, they've really started to use simulation more and more on the healthcare side of things for continued training and especially in training of new graduates. And now they started to share their stories about having students come to them who were so traumatized in simulation in their academic programs that they were fearful of participating in simulation through the healthcare side, through their job, through their on the job training, which is really significant and I think we can all see how obviously that could lead toward you know impacting patient care um, because if you don't get the chance to you know practice the skills that you need to in this what is supposed to be a safe setting um, and then it it just it just started to snowball like I said the whole the whole effect uh, you know from start to finish so from that, we had a friend who is famous in the civility world. Her name is uh, Dr. Cindy Clark. And she said, would you please write a paper for us uh, for a special issue of teaching and learning and nursing? So we have a commission paper that we just submitted the other day about um, this exact topic. And so we did a deeper dive into the literature to see what, what is, else is known out there. And it seems that a lot of this is being caused by the uh, tired, seasoned faculty that are uh, still working post-COVID and a whole new wave of new people coming in or people uh, because the a lot of uh, tired, seasoned faculty retired post-COVID, uh, we've got a lot of new people in simulation who got pressed into service basically with no training at all. And, and they're making it up as they go. And there seems to be a, a I've, I've actually experienced this myself and seen it with other people. Uh, there was an article by Herlihy from two years ago that talks about the trajectory of what people go through and that they usually start off thinking, well, students don't really need objectives. You know, we're just gonna put them in there and it's gonna be fine. Um, and then they, it turns out not well. So then they figure out, well, maybe the students really do need objectives. Um, a lot of us begin with thinking that we're going to give the scenario away if we prepare the students too much. What we find out, and I experienced that myself many years ago when I started in simulation, that uh, there is no way to prepare the students too much. Uh, that That the lecture that you did last week that Oftentimes it was me doing the lecture and I'm wonderful at lecturing and I was sure they would be able to take every pearl I dropped and enact it immediately in the simulation. And it didn't take long to figure out uh, that there really is a, a um, 
knowledge practice gap and that just because the students can get an A on the test or can answer the questions does not mean they know how to apply what they know in the simulation. So making that leap to and getting used to the fact that there really is this gap and that you have to, that is our job as facilitators, I think, is to help them take those notes and then enact it in simulation. For novices, you have to get them over that hump. The more experience they get, the better they get at it. That's been my experience, Lisa. Uh, Lisa Marie, what do you think? Yeah, I was just thinking while you were talking about that idea um, that I think that that this is there's a really good point being made here about um, the expectations of the educator about what the student can do in the simulation. And I have to say, as a new educator, even in classroom, that idea about I've delivered this content to you, now you should be do, able to do X, Y, Z. And we really have to pay attention to, is that enough just to give them the information and then have these expectations? And I think that, um, and, and in this kind of new, you know, post-pandemic world and these students that we're seeing, um, you know, they do need more coaching. Is, is what I've seen. They need more mm -hmm. coaching and they need a little bit more directive about what it means to have this piece of information and then apply it. They, they, that bridge, that's my job as the educator is to figure out how to get them from point A to point B. And so simply giving them information like in simulation, if you do some things like post a video for them to watch or um, have them read an article or a chapter or something like that, and then they're just supposed to take that information, come to simulation, and apply it. That creates so much anxiety for students because it's not clear to them what it is that you are expecting from them. And so when you have really clear learning objectives and you share those with students and you explain them to students, they have a much greater chance of actually meeting that learning objective. And the idea that, like you're saying, Susie, that if you tell them that, if you explain all of that to them, then what's the point of the simulation? Like, what are they going to get out of it? Well, they're going to get everything out of it because that's exactly. the hands-on exactly. piece. It's the experiential piece. It's not words. It's not sentences. It's actions. It's hands-on. This is how you do this. Again, that's my job as the educator is to help get them from the words to the actions. And I do believe that that, that gap has actually gotten bigger, um, especially of late. And that sometimes, and, I, and I've seen this a lot, I, I'm sure I'm guilty of it in my own education, is that you just you just think that they should do it. You just want to put the onus on the student and say, you know, you, I've given you everything you need, you know, what's wrong with you that you can't, you know, now produce these results that I'm looking for. And so when we were talking about all of this with incivility in nursing from educators towards students, it's almost like there's some animosity there from my perspective. And, but there's definitely a stance of, um, punishment and being punitive, that when students don't hit those benchmarks, then there has to be some punishment at play in order to kind of get them to learn their lesson. Um, I have a question for you both. So in my experience doing simulation, sometimes I, I do feel like it does fall into that incivility. Did you hear stories that supported that idea that it, simulation can almost be sort of like a hazing is what it reminded me of. Like, you know, you, you're a, a nursing student and you got to be tough and, and be able to handle this. And, you know, this is what I went through. So you have to go through the same thing. Were there aspects of that involved? Absolutely. In fact, those exact words were used. Right. Um, I'm going to toughen you up for the real world, except that they're not in the real world. They're in simulation, and that's why we do simulation, so that when they hit the real world, they'll be ready for what's going to happen, not have somebody breathing down their neck, <laughs> torturing them. So uh, yes, that that is there. And that is something that um, my experience has been, and I bet for Lisa Marie it has too, 
is that there are times when people come into sim and the demons that they come with uh, are not, they're not, never quite able to get past them and let them die and move on and get into a growth mindset and not slip back into those punitive um, ways of speaking to students and uh, things that come up for them. They're working out their mm -hmm. own problems in the simulation. It's almost like a Rorschach ink blot that you're looking at. And uh, I've, I've had people that were fabulous educators, but could not do simulation because of this particular thing. And that does not mean that they're bad people, not good educators. But in this area where people are at their most vulnerable, there are some people who I think really shouldn't do this. And removed a, a person or two from that from this role for that reason. But they've done other things for simulation, but they should not be facilitators and debriefers. I'm wondering what you think about that. If, if you mean me, I think I, I, there's a couple of things. One is I think that it, unfortunately, it is well known in the nursing world that that phrase nurses eat their young has been around since you know the beginning of the profession it seems and i don't think anyone has ever gotten to the bottom of of what influences that what contributes to that what makes mm -hmm. a seasoned nurse then turn and be so unsupportive of someone new wanting to enter the profession especially when they're coming in and they're so fresh faced and idealistic and excited about, you know, being a nurse and this is great. And then, you know, they get this kind of terrible um, greeting and introduction to the profession, um, which then of course leads to nursing shortages and lack of retention and, and kind of all of that. Um, but I think too is, is it, the similarity is that in simulation is clinical learning. Right, and we continue to make this argument and continue to provide evidence to say that, that these two are synonymous. And so when you take an educator, a clinical educator, a clinical nurse, an expert nurse, experienced, wonderful at practice, and because of nursing faculty shortages, you kind of grab that person and you bring them into the academic world and you don't provide them with all of the training that's needed about not just how to be a simulationist, but how to be an educator. You know, so many people in nurse educator roles have never been taught how to teach. And so you do that. And so all they have to fall back on is their practice experience and whatever they were doing in practice. And that does include how they were precepted and how they act as a preceptor if they ever had that experience. So those are all the factors that they're bringing into the, into this new role as a nurse educator. And then you put them in this simulated clinical experience. And I do say it is one of my kind of core philosophical approaches to teaching nurses is that when you do something in a classroom, if you cheat on a test, if you, you know, these actions, I see that in your practice. I see how that can translate into your practice. So if you cheat on a test, then I see you doing workarounds that risk patient safety in clinical. And now, because I've been an educator for, I think it's going close, close to 20 years, I've been able to temper that along the way to say, okay, I see this. I see where it can lead, but let's stop it, right? I can I can take action to get you to not jump from A to B like I used to do. Like I see now there's all these incremental steps. But if you took me as an experienced nurse without teaching me how to teach and you put me in a setting where I'm in a clinical situation with a student and they make a mistake they give the wrong medication, they give the wrong dosage of medication, they don't check the patient's ID band in simulation. Well, my mindset is I'm a clinical nurse and now all of a sudden it has direct implications for patient safety. I don't see all those little steps. I don't see how this is an opportunity for me to stop you from getting all the way to, down the line to risking patient safety and potentially resulting in patient injury or death. 
So it's this piece of all of this cushioning that needs to happen and the identification of all of these steps that need, that can take place between point A and point B is where we as simulationists, as nurse educators, as educators in general, can stop this forward progression and help the students identify where it could go if behavior isn't changed. Hey, Connor, have you ever wished that you could test your medical skills in a realistic but low stakes environment? No, I haven't. <laughs> You're not a medical person, but that's okay because it's not a fantasy. It's called VR Patients. That's right, Devin. VR Patients is a groundbreaking platform that lets you create your own virtual reality simulations. It's like a choose your own adventure book, but for medical scenarios. And it's not just one kind of scenario. Any simulation you can imagine. You want to create a complex critical care trauma or a simple basic life support patient? You can do it all with VR patients. And best of all, it's highly scalable, catering to 10 students or 10,000. Connor, did you know that they recently deployed to the entire state of Maine? I saw an article about that. You really have to check it out for yourself at vrpatients.com. That's vrpatients.com for more information. And if you're like Connor and you don't know medicine, but you got a VR headset at home, you can try it right now for free on the MetaQuest Store or Steam. I'm really glad that you kind of looped it back to the student because one of the things that I want to highlight for people is that we're talking, we, there is a nursing shortage, not this future idea that there might be a nursing shortage one day. <laughs> it is arrived. And we talk about that quite frequently. So the results of not just, not just being too hard on a student, let's, let's make sure that the audience understands that this is a new student who recognizes they are heading into a field where they're going to be taking care of people who will be sick, injured, dying, and they have to pretend like it's real today. And now they're being watched by their whole class in person. And these proctors, these preceptors, these nurse educators over their shoulders, staring, saying, go time to perform. Don't let them get sick. Don't or Don't let them die. You kind of looped it back to the student. I just want to ask you, what is the potential impact? Like, why is it such a big deal to give, to raise a student's blood pressure? during because that's probably what people are thinking right all they're doing is raising a student's blood pressure like what are the potential impacts of this type of raising a student's blood pressure or really it's abuse right it's really it's like abuse in the simulation <clears throat> center well we're really talking about you stress which is i'm alert and ready to to do the work versus distress, which is I get so freaked out by what's going on around me that I can't see anything. You know how your your field of vision narrows and all you can see, <clears throat> if anything, is tunnel vision and you can't see the monitor. You can't see the patient turning gray. You can't see a lot of things. So titrating the stress is one of those skills that the educator really needs to work on and be good at which is why if we're going to run these high stress scenarios, and there are some that we know cause high stress for everybody. There are some that are pretty routine. Probably anybody could do it. But when you're getting into high emotional events or things that people might have experienced themselves or that involve death, um, we need to be prepared for that. And you probably need your best simulationist. You need the trained people there. You need the best of the best running those scenarios, not just anybody who happened to be scheduled for that day. And that's the scenario that's going to happen. So those are all interventions that um, <clears throat> people in charge of simulation can take is really looking at the schedule and seeing what's going to be run and who have I got on there to manage these this group of students and how have we prepared? Have we done a dry run? Um, are we prepared for if somebody has an emotional reaction, do we have somebody who can handle that person and another person keep the whole thing going for everybody else? The student shouldn't have to manage themselves or themselves as a group because an educator um, was not prepared. And I think that happens sometimes. So these are all things that go into the mix. It sounded like Lisa Marie, yeah, that you were I saying agree. also that that some of it is a leveling issue when you have inexperienced educators who haven't been well-trained in yeah. how to run and facilitate simulation, that they may not understand what is an appropriate level for that level of student. Is that true? 
Yeah, Abs absolutely. Yeah. And, and what Susie was saying is about that idea that, you know, some stress, some anxiety is actually right. helps, right? It helps you learn that heightened anxiety. You've yes. got all that stuff going and your awareness is going and everything's, and that's, that's what you're trying to hit is that kind of, you know, perfect balance of having enough stress on board so that you've got the person's full attention, right? They're fully engaged um, versus you tip the scales and now it, they, they kind of go into survival mode, you know, and they're, they're just really worried about self-preservation at this point, right? That, um, like you said, everyone's looking at them. Who, who likes that? Nobody likes that, especially when you're performing. I mean, I've had, you know, I, I remember starting an IV in clinical once on a patient and um, I was with students and the patient said, um, is your hand shaking? <laughs> And I said, there's 10 students watching me. Yes, my hand is shaking. Yeah. It'll be okay, you know. But I like I had the full self-awareness to be able to know all of that, right? I, I contextually, I'm situationally aware for that. But, you know, that's not true for students who this is all about, especially if they're being evaluated in any way. Then that really pushes everything up up that scale of stress. But I will say there there is a balance to strike. And I did a, a short, very brief little kind of pre-post um, stress state evaluation on some students in this really complex uh, simulation that I run, multi-patient, lots of stuff going on. And um, and I apologize, I can't remember the name of the instrument that I used, but it measured a, a stress state and it was specific about before and after some kind of learning activity. Um, and what I found, thankfully, was that I actually, the, the simulation, simulation actually energized the students. It actually increased their like wakefulness and attention and even their um, kind of, emotional state of happiness and whatever these other words were that were captured on this instrument. Um, so that was really fun to know because I have had students ex um, run through this particular simulation and not be, not come out very happy about it for different reasons about what happened during the simulation. Uh, a lot of the times it had to do with peers or it had to do with technological difficulties, which is, you know, usually a bummer. Um, but for the most part, these students were coming out of this and saying that they were, you know, had, had actually gotten energized by being um, participating in the simulation. And that's really what we would strive for, right? Because then we know that they're engaging and they're not feeling um, run down or beat up or, you know, that defeated, which is what a lot of times I think happens is that they come out and they feel defeated by that, by the simulation. That's interesting. I think it's really cool that they're basically flipping the appropriate switch on and they're on, right? right. That's what, when these students are like, their energy levels are raising, their attention is raising. That's what you want. They're treating the sim like it's real. Right. And then we say here quite often, fail often, fail fast. I don't know when it started, but back when I was in school as well, when did the expectation begin that you needed to succeed on your first try in school? Why, why isn't sim, simulation school, no matter what department or area you're working in, it doesn't have to be healthcare, but even specifically healthcare, why is it expected that patient, that students would win in these patient scenarios? They're not a nurse yet. Right. This is the place to make a mistake. And I just find that so fascinating that, that some of us educators out there might feel like we need to do more to get these students to the next level and we might be overdoing it. I was just I was just t thinking though about deliberate practice, the deliberate practice model and how that hmm. supports this idea about kind of leveling and layering on learning. And that well, I'm not familiar with the deliberate practice. Oh, okay. Can you teach me and our listeners? Sure, sure. So deliberate practice is you have some clear learning objectives that you want the students to um, reach. It usually is an evaluated simulation versus, you know, kind of a simulation for learning. And that is it. It should reside on all of these premises that we're talking about, about providing students with all of the learning objectives. If there is a grading rubric that's going to be used, 
sharing that with the student right up front, making sure that they understand, you know, how all of these pieces are, you know, going to be evaluated and, and what the scale is, like if there's a number of points that they can earn on any particular component, then what that looks like. Um, but in deliberate practice, and, and my school does one model of that where the students are given the patient scenario, they are provided with the rubric, they work in pairs, and they, um, they're scheduled for a particular time and they come in and they're extremely nervous but they even though they know that their first run through isn't going to be graded so they come in they perform they participate in this simulation and then the faculty facilitator goes through the rubric and says if this is where your grade would come from today this is what you would have earned and this is how you can improve when you come back to do it next time right. for real for your grade and so the students kind of go away they saw a completely different day they come back and then they actually perform for the grade it's a slightly different situation scenario but very very similar rubric is the same setting is the same everything is the same um, but they come in and that second time is when they um, perform for a grade so that idea about it still doesn't reduce full uh, student anxiety, but that idea about you get a chance to do it without earning a grade, at mm. least, kind of gives you a chance to get the feel for the environment without the highest level of anxiety. Well, how does technology fit into all of this? I mean, if there's one thing that's changing faster than anything right now, it's the technology and it is impacting the healthcare industry and the simulation industry. So we've got artificial intelligence, augmented reality, virtual reality. What does the future of nursing education look like? Like how do you how do you envision the future of simulation and nursing with all of this tech kind of rolling down a mountain towards us? Do you see more of this type of abuse? Go ahead. No, I see less of this abuse because AI is not going to abuse the student. And there are, it's getting smarter and smarter and, and talking more and more and is being trained to give good feedback. Um, emotion, maybe some emotion to it, but a positive emotion, not negative emotion or encouraging emotion. So uh, I think that it's going to make a huge difference and will sadly negate some of the things, the, some of the strides that educators have learned and made along the way to get better at being better educators because AI is going to be able to do some of this better for us. And uh, I, I look forward to the day when we have VR and AR capabilities for students to be able to repeat scenarios and get AI feedback because then they can come into the Sim Center and perform in front of a real human and they're going to probably be fabulous hmm. and will have learned without training scars uh, and be ready to then move on to the next event, whatever that might be. If that type of burden is lifted, burden, uh, I'm kind of driving at is that I've heard a lot of educators say that they're a little bit afraid of some of this technology, maybe replacing some of the things that they already do today or that they're trying to do well today. And I would... Uh, just kind of want to toss your guys' way. What are the things uh, that a nurse educator will be able to focus on more, will have more time to do because of the time savings they will receive from these technologies doing things that are making students competent in certain areas? Are there things that the nurse educator will have more time for? I think it'll be, I think it will give us a lot of time to then really look at uh, we, with the any AI uh, and software or computer software, there are uh, time to treat, time to intervention kind of things that you can look at to see. And there's more research to be done there on what can be done to improve a computer program to make a student get better faster. There are ways to do that. Yeah. And I know that those things are available right now. And we just that the educators have not figured out how to do it. It's on the production side that they know where those where those markers are and what is being collected that we as educators should be asking. I need to be able to see that, too, so that I know 
what to improve on in my own teaching and what I can help you do as, as your developers. So this is where nurses and, and developers need to work together to mm -hmm. uh, produce really good software for, for student uh, education um, yeah. is what I think. Yeah. And I, I think there think, are Ms. some Marie? things, yeah, I think there are some things that are, that those platforms could be really good at, and that can be things that require that repetitive um, kind of action. So checking medication safety, right? Ch making sure that that's checked every single time um, when you go through a, a program like that, that records your actions every time that you do one of those things. Um, and then in terms of leaving or making some room for what else we could accomplish when those things are set aside or for me are things like communication skills, because that's very difficult to replicate in um, electronic formats or even with high fidelity, you know, technology mm -hmm. mannequins um, versus using standardized patients or just having that in person kind of thing. Um, so uh, that you know, things like recognizing nonverbal cues, those are very difficult to replicate in those kind of um, scenarios, even though they're getting better, you know, the graphics are getting better, just like when, you know, I first started doing first person, you know, games on my PC versus now they're on PlayStation and they're so, so Oh my good. goodness, we have a gamer <laughs> in our hands. Oh my goodness, yeah. I From you know, like line drawings, like Mech Warrior line drawings, I, oh I'm, my goodness. yeah. <laughs> That's exciting. Well, you know, you're bringing up something really important, I think, and it's just there are just certain things that are unnecessary to try to uh, replace or change in a digital setting. They're just better in person. Right. Um, yes. For example, I personally don't believe as good as haptics will get one day, uh, touching skin cannot go away from the healthcare clinical um, setting. Right. So you're not going to learn how to palpate skin with controllers or no controllers, right? With air. You, 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 there's just certain things you're going to have to do in person. There's no need to try to replace those because what we're creating is, what we should be creating is a well-rounded toolkit that listens to the nurse educator and says, well, this is actually the tool on my tool belt that's a little rusty and I'd like a new one because it's you know sharper and better and faster, but I'm going to use it on my students the way that it's supposed to be used. Right. And I, I think to the point you're making that that always does kind of rile me up a little bit is the idea that, you know, it's a very lucrative business, the creation of technology, mannequins, task trainers, VR platforms, AR platforms, all of those. And so, you know, if you they really need to stay informed you know, through the nurse educator lens or through the healthcare professional lens about, you know, what those true learning objectives are and, mm -hmm. and how, you know, like, let's not kind of focus on things that we don't really think are that highly important if you're going to have the students spend this time. Or what I've seen with some of them is that they get bogged down in these checklists that are available for certain skills. And then the student gets really frustrated on the platform because it doesn't either doesn't let them move forward, you know, to the next step if they've missed something or they kind of, um, they can't find it. Like they can't find mm -hmm. it on the platform, how to do this thing that the program wants them to do. They have and to so learn to navigate a fake world so they right. can practice in a real world, exactly. which is like slowing things down. Right. Yes. And that can, that's a, can be a steep learning curve, especially if a, if a, you know, nursing school or a school of uh, professionals uses different platforms, then you have to learn how to navigate each platform separately. We we had that a little bit of that happen through the pandemic when we really started using multiple platforms and then you realize they're all so different um, and, and not necessarily intuitive. Some of them are more intuitive than others. Hey, Connor, are you finding it challenging to organize asynchronous clinical education for all your students? Devin, I don't have any students. Well, that's okay, because no matter the class size from 10 to 10,000 students, we have the perfect solution for you. VR Patients isn't just a virtual reality platform. It's an asynchronous learning tool, which means students can access it anywhere, anytime. Exactly. They can jump into a VR simulation from their VR headset or even from their web browser. Clinical competency training doesn't have to be confined to a specific schedule or location anymore. To learn more about how VR patients can make learning more accessible and scalable, 
head over to vrpatients.com. That's vrpatients.com. And if you don't have any students just like Connor, but you do have a VR headset, you can try it right now for free on the MetaQuest Store or Steam. Well, we are coming up on time. And so I want to be mindful. We've only got a few more minutes. Um, and so I just want to ask you guys a, a couple of questions that we we ask every guest, really. Um, so one of the questions is, what would you tell a budding, exciting nurse student or someone who wants to become a nurse? They're listening to this podcast right now. Um, what would you tell them as they enter this profession? Maybe they're going to run into what we're talking about. How do we equip them? Actually, Cindy Clark and I did some research on this, and we practiced with scripts that people could say that would be respectful, um, but say, basically, what I'm hearing is it sounds like um, you're picking on me or abuse. I would like for you to stop. Can, we, can you tell me in another way what it is you want me to do or how I can improve? And helping each other learn to be respectful when asking or, or feeling like you are being um, trod upon in some way, being able to ask for what you need in a respectful way that should not set off somebody who's already perhaps heading towards a bullying state. So practicing that, what we found was students were, could practice and practice and practice and have, have what they thought was a great script. Yeah. But when it happens, they're not ready for it. And they they weren't able to pull up their prepared script in their mm -hmm. heads and that they probably have to have, unfortunately, have that experience a couple of times before they get pretty good at pulling up that script so that they can ask for respectful communication. Um, so I would say get that script ready and be able to give somebody the feedback that they need to get better at getting better. Um, and so I think talking about a growth mindset for all of us, for students and for us, and being able to, as a professor, say to students, if I slip up or if I sound like I'm not being helpful to you, give me some feedback to let me know that. And if I hear myself kind of going off piste, shall we say, I may pull myself back and say, I want to rephrase what I just said. That did not come out the way I meant it. Let me try again so that we're modeling that behavior so that maybe we can nip this um, abuse thing in the bud in school. Because if we don't in school, I fear that it will continue into the workplace. So those would be my words that I think I would be saying to people at this time as they start school. Let me toss this uh, alternative to Lisa Marie. What would you tell the educator, be it a new educator or a seasoned one? Um, maybe an educator who was onboarded during COVID. So they're uh, at a different place today. Um, what would you tell them to ensure that they're able to give the appropriate amount of eustress to a student in SIM? It's some of the same things Susie just said. Uh, and that idea about being in a growth mindset is, is really key. Um, you have to stay open to learning your your craft and um, so doing observations of people who are considered experts in your environment so that you can learn directly from those I, I think we learn really well from being able to see someone do something versus just kind of learning but also seeking out other educational opportunities um, teaching is not a natural ability and i think in nursing we do expect that people know how to do that um, and so if you've never had formal training to learn how to be a teacher, um, that's you need to seek out that kind of training. Sometimes your school provides it and sometimes it doesn't. So you might have to be proactive about that. Um, and then having a really good sense of empathy towards students is really important to be able to just work as hard as you can to put yourself in their sh in their shoes to see um what's what they're seeing and to experience what they're seeing and understanding that when you kind of you know have a, this punitive approach that it 
it really, it's so demoralizing and so defeating to the student mm -hmm. that it takes them a long time to get back up to a place where that they can take the next step. It, you know, it really knocks them down. And so they really, you really have to be cognizant of, of what you say and how you say it to students um, so that you're not, you're not creating this environment where they're fearful and they're so apprehensive about what your reaction is going to be to something that they've said or done um, that they're actually focusing on on what the learning is that that you're trying to convey. And keep in mind, this student might treat you in the hospital one day. You're not just training a student; you're training a healthcare professional who's going to take care of the community. Right. So. The nurse who is going to give you an IV in medicine, how do you want them to have been trained when they are going to make you better? And I want to touch on one more thing, and then I'll toss the mic to uh, Martha, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, you know, a growth mindset, folks, it's not just – I feel like we need to define that. It's not just like, oh, okay, I need to think about growing and be open to growing. It's an actual thing, so you can Google it. There's many definitions. I'm going to read a couple of things for you and add anything, any color that you guys want, but just for the listeners – what is a growth mindset and what's the difference between that and a fixed mindset? So for both students and educators, a growth mindset contrasts with a fixed mindset. The latter is the limiting belief that the capacity to learn and improve cannot be meaningfully developed. The growth mindset, conversely, is open to the effort, even if it takes time. Proponents of the theory contend that adopting growth mindset and rejecting a fixed mindset can help people be successful more often. So we're talking about um, the belief that your abilities can be developed through effort, learning, persistence. These are very vague words that we all say in education, like, right, growth. And then we we hammer on students yeah. and we expect the moon out of them. It's like accept flaws and mistakes and opportunities for improvement for the educator too. Understanding on the student side, when you feel something that just doesn't feel right, it's okay to say this doesn't feel right. Can we try again? This is school. This is the place to try again. Um, and if you had anything to add to that, please do. There's tons that you can read on a growth mindset. I highly recommend people check it out. I really love a growth mindset, except I'm not sure my brain is ever going to grow enough to do algebra. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> Me neither. Uh <laughs> I like geometry and shapes, but algebra couldn't get it. Yeah, yeah. I just like no, that didn't work. Um, and and I don't know if that's really true or not. If Khan Academy had existed back then, um, maybe I would have been mm -hmm. very successful. And interestingly enough, Khan Academy has nursing stuff on it now, as I understand it. I looked a few years ago and I found a couple things. I don't know how much more there is, but you haven't lived till somebody comes up in a lecture to you and says. Actually, that was a really terrible lecture. And if you listen to this <laughs> podcast or to this YouTube video, you will learn something because they do it much better than you do. And it's that would be for many of us adopting a growth mindset is it going out there and looking at some of these things and seeing how other people do it because there are so many excellent uh, examples out there these days. So I think we can all learn from a growth mindset. And I, I think a really important component mm. of that is reflection, is, is self-reflection, both for students and for educators, is to be able to, and, and for students, it's the educator's job to kind of help that process, right, is that we give them prompts if we want them to do a written reflection or in debriefing, we're really thoughtful about how we do that and we're not, you know, pointing out, just pointing out their mistakes, we're really talking about how to, you know, what was the thought process. But also for educators and and getting student feedback that can sometimes be kind of harsh, but really mining for those lessons about how could I have done this better? You know, I, obviously I missed the mark here. And so not taking that personally, but taking it professionally and saying, well, OK, ne next time I do this, how can I how can I be better at this? Or even knowing that you're not good at algebra knowing that you're not good at something and then seeking out the resources that you need in order to improve. And those are, those are really important pieces, I think. And okay, there's we another, have one well, last thing. Oh, please go. Okay. And then we'll do one. There's last one thing. more piece that go, fits with that though. And that is that educators need to be okay with being vulnerable enough that their administrators, administrators will give them that space to be vulnerable and to learn not to be punitive with them when they get terrible student evaluations because those first few years of teaching, 
the students smell blood on the water too, and they can be vicious. So being able to be understanding and to provide mentorship and help and support and, and let people know that you're going to get better at this and let me help you rather than, you know, this may not be for you from the very first semester. This is not a good thing where everybody needs a chance to develop that, the craft of teaching. Well, all we have left today is the wrap up and lightning round. And I didn't prepare you guys for the lightning round. And all it is, is we're going to ask you some simple questions that you already know the answer to that are just easy breezy that have nothing to do with healthcare necessarily. Um, for everyone who's listening, the article that we are referencing is called Stop Pre-Licensure Student Abuse in Simulation. That's um, available on the simzine.news website or on LinkedIn. And we will put Lisa Marie and Susie Edgren's uh, information in the show notes so you can follow them and read their stuff. They have tons of published articles and they're very authoritative. Please follow them. So Martha and I are just going to ask you guys a couple of questions. We'll just pick like maybe two or three each. Martha, we'll go back and forth. Um, you are. I'll do you want to start uh, with the first if one? If you could choose a superpower, what superpower would you choose? I've always wanted to fly without an airplane. <laughs> yeah. So I would take one. flying. <laughs> oh, goodness. Lisa Marie, the gamer, she's like, oh, I actually, I don't know. There's, there's too many so, to choose from. There's so many. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, what was the first one that popped I, into your head? Just, uh, just magic in general. I, you know, just to, to be able to do magic, <laughs> not one. magic tricks, like actual magic, like a witch, like Harry yes. Potter. Yes. Awesome. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> if you could have dinner with a historical figure, dead or alive, Susie, oh. who would you choose? Probably George Washington. That's a good one. What do you got, Lisa Marie? Uh, I'm going to say Thomas Jefferson. Oh, interesting. Very creative and yeah. Very cool. Uh, what is your favorite way to unwind after work? Running. Um, She's got the health mindset. Well done. Yeah. That's what all of our nursing students should do, right? They should... Do their sim and then go for a run. Actually, <laughs> we tell them to run before they come to sim. Yeah, oh, that's good, good. good. Nice. Um, I really like to be creative. I do a lot of like just home projects and like, you know, cre creating something, just doing little, little crafty projects Great. or something like that. All right. Um, last one. If you could travel to any time period, where would you travel to? You know, um, I spent a lot of time in ruins. Um, I had started a doctorate in medical anthropology, and I had to do um, a lot of uh, uh, other courses because I had no background in anthropology. And so I had to do uh, archaeology. And I have been to the pyramids at Giza. I have been to Tulum. I just came back from a, another place, a Mayan ruins in, in uh South America, someplace where I can't remember the name of them, but I said, I would love to be here to see them really use this. And what did this city really look like at that time? So um, what was the question? Because I'm suddenly I'm talking about archaeology. You go back here. to the Mayan ruins. Right? I, would go, I, would go, I want to see these ruins in action. A lot of yeah. these things. That's awesome. I, that's a great one. I, I think that's always a trick question for me because then I'm like all of the oppression of like women and all of those restrictions, you know, tend to come into play whenever you talk about different um, eras right. in, in our past and all of kind of the yuckiness that happened like in the 1800s and stuff like that. Sure. But I don't know. I think the 1920s, I think the 1920s <gasps> the would 20s. be like a lot of fun. I think people were just got a little looser and just yeah. a little funner and just, you know, That's jazz was one. coming. I just, I think, I think that might be a lot of fun. You know, what's scary. That's a hundred years ago. Thanks, it's 2024. Yeah, right. Thanks. David. That's frightening. Crazy. Everybody. You're welcome. Thank you all so much. Uh, last thing, we're going to be at IMSH um, independently, so we should definitely grab a coffee. And if you're not going, I think it's also going to be virtual this year. If you are going, come find us. Um, I'm going to be at booth 1108, 
but uh, we'll be around. Ping us on LinkedIn, and if you message us, we'll all have coffee together, and we can talk and chat. But um, come to IMSH. Susie's giving a talk as well, so look for her on the program. Are you giving a? Are you doing anything at uh, IMSH, Lisa Marie? I'm on a um, panel that we're talking about the um, using this using simulation mm-hmm. to meet the new essentials, the AACN essentials. Great. So check the program for IMSH if you're going to be there. Listen to our experts, and thank you all for joining us on the Immersive Med Pod. We will see you next time. Thanks so much. Thank you. Okay, listeners, have you ever thought about the difference between simply editing something and truly authoring it? Devin, that all sounds like the same thing. Not quite, Connor. Editing is just making changes to someone else's content, but authoring? That's crafting something from scratch. With VR Patients' latest Infusions authoring tool update, healthcare educators can author their own intricate simulations. (laughs) That sounds empowering. It is, but it goes beyond that. What you author with VR Patients, you own. Your creations are safeguarded as your intellectual property. Imagine being the architect of your own virtual training experiences, defining outcomes, and owning the rights to them forever. So it's like having a patent on an invention? Exactly. Clinical educators aren't just passive technology users. They are authors, innovators in their domain. With VR patients, they're creating the future of healthcare simulation. (laughs) Incredible. For those looking to become pioneers in healthcare education, where should they start? Begin your authoring journey and safeguard your creations with VR patients. Learn more at vrpatients.com. Remember, folks, the future isn't just about using innovations. It's about owning them. Dive in at vrpatients.com.